Australia when black birch is on a very dry and sort of stressful site than uh, nectria than, than when black birch is on a, a better, more productive site. Um, anyway, uh, nectria disease. Now we're moving into the cherries. Before you do, Phil, Sarah asked what causes the infection. She wanted to know if it was an insect, bacteria, um, but it's a fungus. Yes, um, it's a fungus, yeah. And the way fungus, the Sarah. fungi work is they enter through some kind of a crack in the bark, and then they send out uh, their mycelial strands and all the other things that fungi do. They're not root systems, and they create pressure underneath that bark and cause a crack and the tree is trying to uh, say heal over or compartmentalize that and uh, the crack is how the fungus then disperses its spores out into the air and infects other trees around it or other portions of that tree. So the cracking is good for the fungus, it's not good for the tree and as Fred said the tree, uh, black birches ultimately rot and decay somewhere near that or break off from the wind because the tree is so weakened by that infection point. So let's move on to the cherries. And you may remember when we first introduced birches, we talked about lenisols. And uh, I made the statement that when you see a lenisol that's horizontal and narrow and long, think birch or cherry. And this is black birch. Um, Black birch has really the most black bark of any of the trees that we're going to introduce you to today. In fact, I think it's the darkest bark of any of our native trees. Uh, a teacher I knew uh, told me she had shown this, tried to introduce this to her kids. And one of the boys said, oh, yeah, that looks just like burnt potato chips glued on the tree. <laughs> I don't know about burnt potato chips, but if that works for you, that kind of does describe what black birch bark is. They're little small plates that pop up and uh, you have the lenisols on you when you look close and it's, it's a very characteristic bark. Uh, it, it almost never fails to help you identify it. Um, and uh, by the way, a number of these photos, the one on the left particularly, these were taken at the Burley Farm in Epping, uh, Southeast Land Trust property, one of our, our most outstanding properties. And I know Nancy Chase, I think, is on watching this. So Nancy, these are part of the property here. Um, and thanks so much for helping us to conserve that family land. Um, so we have an example of the twig on the left. Um, it has smaller lenisols that aren't linear when they're twigs. One of the big differences between cherry and birch um, is that instead of having a nice wintergreen odor as you, and taste as you do with yellow and black birch, what you have with the cherries is a really sour, uh, kind of awful bitter almond taste. It's prussic acid actually. Um, and that's quite strong year round. So the cherries are gonna give you that yellow and black birch, you have the nice wintergreen odor. We don't have a good slide of black knot fungus spread for some, for some reason we couldn't find that. Um, uh, but at any rate, um, it's a typical fungus that attacks cherry and you see it up in the crown. It's named black knot because it has a circular, very black, not looking, uh, Appearance. I put a black birch on the right hand side of this by comparison because I find that when I do these workshops, people will often ask me, well, doesn't that look like a black birch? So left side, you've got black cherry, right side, you've got black birch. When you have them side, that's one of the nice things about doing this as a slide presentation. You can do that comparison here. I think they're quite different, but uh, hopefully this will help you with that comparison. One thing, one other thing about black cherry, uh, if a black cherry has a wound, uh, black cherry has pitch pockets within the wood and you may find a, a an amber uh, colored pitch oozing out of that wound. So that's another way to, um, to identify black cherry. Um, 
and I was going to say something else about black cherry, but uh, it escapes me at the moment. So go ahead, Phil. I think you're on, Fred. Uh, well, I've got the black cherry blackboard slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, ignore the man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. The next species we're going to talk about is pin cherry. Uh, it's also in the prunus family. Like gray birch, pin cherry is an early successional species. Uh, if you take a walk on the Burley property in Epping and you go past the field through the area that was uh, had the wildlife cut, uh, you'll find a lot of pin cherry growing along the, the pathway there. It has a, a bronze to red uh, color of the uh, young saplings that are in front of me in the picture. And as it gets larger, you can see the large horizontal lenticels uh, on, the, on the bark of the, of the pole-sized pin cherry. Again, it's not a very long-lived species, maybe 40 to 60 years, but it is one of the first species that you will find uh, when you come into an area that has recently, be cleared, has recently been cleared. A lot of these uh, species, they're not only prolific seed, seed sources, but they also form a seed bank. So you may see in a clear cut, say, um, some of these species that are growing that were not part of the main stand. Well, it's because their seed persists in the soil for years and years, and it just takes the right climactic events, the warming of the soil, um, and the lack of, of an overstory sh uh, shade for these trees to sprout up. And again, they form thick clumps. Um, it's great habitat for wildlife, particularly those that are trying to escape from raptors. And so um, over time, when, I, when a stand of trees first forms, you could have 10 to 15,000 stems per acre. By the time that stand is 100 years old, you may be down to 200 stems per acre just through natural mortality. Go ahead, Phil. Pin cherry, uh, as I said, the bark is, is shiny reddish brown. Um, in some cases, it appears bronze to me. Uh, it has the very large dark purple lenticels and it has the buds clustered into the, uh, the terminal area it's very similar to oaks. And again, it's, it's a very short-lived tree with rapid growth. Go ahead. Let me just add, Fred had mentioned that seed bank. Uh, I remember reading uh, some research on pin cherry, and I don't know how they determined this, but the scientists that published this estimated that pin cherry seed can be still viable for more than a hundred years if it's buried in the understory in the right conditions. So when that forest either dies or is cut or burns down or whatever the, the, the incident is that exposes that seed to the right temperature and conditions, it's there as much as a hundred years later. So it's a pretty neat setup, a pretty new evolutionary adaptation. But that, that particular species is pretty extreme in terms of it being on the early succession ends of things. I would say a 20-year-old or 30-year-old pin cherry is quite old. They grow really fast. They start reproducing young. They, they give off a lot of seed every year, and then they're done. It, it, that's a typical formula for the early succession species. Well, now we're going to dive into the oaks. And for the southern half of New Hampshire, uh, this is a really important group uh, to, to know. Uh, again, if you think about the way New Hampshire is set up, long and skinny, uh, oaks drop out. By the time you get to the northern part of the state, the White Mounds pretty much block most oaks. Though you do see red oak, this species, moving up the Connecticut River a little bit further but oaks are pretty much done by the time you get to uh, the upper half of the state of New Hampshire. And this is our most common oak, and it's one of our most spectacular trees, red oak. Uh, this is described as what we think of as furrowed bark, those grooves that you see that are 
uh, vertical on the tree next to where Fred's standing. And you can see the pink or salmon color in the bottom of those grooves. Uh, the grooves, the furrows go all the way to the ground. The tree on the right is a uh, about a six inch diameter tree. The furrows haven't really started to develop, but you can see the pink or reddish lines on that bark all the way to the ground. So those, those are going to develop into furrows as that tree ages and it will happen very soon. But it's important to remember that for red oak, the grooves go to the ground. Again, we have clustered end buds and red oak buds. Look as though you took a football, they're the same basic color as a football, cut off one of the pointed ends and stuck it on the end of a twig. Uh, that's pretty much the description of the red oak bud. Fred, I'll let you do this. Okay, white oak. Uh, white oak is another species that we lose uh, north of, of Rockingham County. It's a more of a mid-Atlantic, uh, Midwestern species down to Tennessee, Kentucky. But we do have them in New Hampshire. It has a light gray scaly bark. You can see on the, uh, on the left, um, it shows up in the sunlight as being almost white. And then on the left uh, is a more typical example of, of what you would see on a tree that is in the saw timber class. White oak uh, will hold on to its leaves when it's a sapling. Uh, so in the winter time, if you see a young oak tree that still has its leaves, um, you should take a very close look at the leaf margins. If the lobes are rounded, it's a white oak or it's in the white oak group, white oak, swamp white oak. If it's got a pointed lobe, it's in the red oak group. So, and we'll go into that a little bit more as we talk about the, uh, the difference between red and black oaks, but rounded lobes, white oak group, pointed lobes, red oak group. Go ahead. So just a couple things. Fred has, I think, a couple times said saw timber, just so folks know what foresters are talking about. We, we measure trees at four and a half feet above the ground and we're thinking of their diameter. And so when a tree is big enough, when it's about 12 inches at that point or higher, 12 inches in diameter at breast height or larger, uh, we refer to that as a saw timber sized tree. It's an old English term that just means it could be sawn into boards. Um, that might not be what it would be used for. It could be used for veneer or something else, but it's got the size to be able to be converted to that. So that's one of those uh, additional uh, New York Times crossword puzzle things that you'll, that'll be helpful. Another couple of quick notes about the oak groups. Fred said there's the red oak group and the white oak group. Some call it the black oak group and the white oak group, doesn't matter. The way these oaks are evolving is they're going off into these two branches. And they're, when you look at the wood properties of these, these species, the groups are, are similar, but the two groups are different from each other. And one simple way to remember it is the red oak group, if you were to look at the lumber, the pores in the red oak group are wide open. They're like little straws. And so the red oak group uh, is not the kind of uh, the lumber that you make out of it is not going to be used for making barrels, uh, for holding uh, expensive whiskey or wine, that kind of thing, or for boats. They'd leak. The white oak group, on the other hand, the pores are filled with a natural chemical that protects the heartwood, particularly of this, of this whole group of white oaks. Um, and so they're very, they tend to be decay resistant and they're used for, they were used a lot for boat building and applications where uh, we needed to have weather type kind of conditions. Um, there are a lot of oaks. There are a lot of oaks in the United States and there are more oaks in, in Mexico. Actually, Mexico has the most diverse oak uh, speciation in the world. I think something like 150 
we have, I think it's 86 species in the United States. Um, uh, so they're, they're quite a diverse group. Uh, we have a bunch here and we're just showing you the really common ones right now. But again, they disappear as you move north in the state. Is this um, mine, Fred? Yeah, just one more thing about White Oak, Phil. Um, I, was, I went to a, a national forestry meeting in Louisville, Kentucky in 2019, and I did not realize that it's the sugars in White Oak that make whiskey into bourbon. There you go. Oh, another tidbit. There you go. But before we move on, um, can you help with differentiating the furrowed bark of the white ash and the red oak as they seem similar? We're going to see ash later. Okay. And so I'm going to hold that off, but they are not at all similar just so that we can dispel that right off. Um, okay. And you're going to see that they're not, um, in fact, I wouldn't have them side by side as a species, as two different species that you might confuse. Okay. If, there's anything, our... if there's anything you might confuse with white oak, I would think it would be American elm. Mm -hmm. We're going to see that later. And with the, um, are the pores in the oaks visibly different? Yes. And the lumber is visibly different. Red oak lumber is, as the name implies, very, has a very reddish color. And our lumber, the red oak has quite a distribution in the country. It goes quite a way south here. And uh, the red oak in the northeast, Fred and I are finding, uh, was, was really the preferred oak for export to the Chinese market for quite a while, about 95% of our oak for, for a time before the tariffs came in uh, was being exported. That's because the, it had the highest, you know, incidence of that really rich red color that is used in flooring and cabinetry, that sort of thing. White oak is a very different wood. It's, it's got more sheen to it and, um, um, it and it has very interesting character. It's used a lot in flooring uh, and various other things. So it, it also has a lot of applications uh, but it is very different, much lighter colored. Oak, okay. Oaks are, are a ring porous species, meaning that in the early spring when the wood starts growing, they're putting on the, the pores, the vascular system of the tree and before they put on the late wood, which is which the pores are all in the early wood, um, oaks also have what are called rays, which give the wood even greater strength. Yeah, and the rays in the white oak are really what make it, when you saw it, that's what you see a lot more of. It really gives it a lot of that character because they're much more pronounced in the white oak group. Okay, we're going to move on to the close relative of red oak that we have that's very common in the southern part of the state, and that's black oak. It's one of the close relatives, I should say. Um, and we find, uh, again, when we do these workshops, that people have a tough time with red and black oak, and really that's understandable. They're, they're closely related, but the thing we try to show to folks that I think is the best distinguishing feature in the field is this blocky, the square blocky bark on the bottom of the trunk of black oak. Uh, if you remember when we introduced red oak, we said that it's furrowed bark and the furrows go all the way to the ground. And you can see on black oak, that's not the case. There are furrows and it looks like a red oak up higher, but as you get down toward the ground, it, the bark is quite different. It has that square, blocky texture and pattern. Um, the other thing about black oak to note is that it's usually a lot limier. It isn't always, but it is very often found on much poorer sites than red oak. So uh, as you go upslope and get toward ledgy conditions and drier conditions, you're gonna find more black oak, less red oak. Uh, 
Uh, if you're on very sandy areas like the Kingston Plains or if we're in Epping or all along the Route 125 corridor, you're likely to have a lot of black oak in that mixture because they're much more uh, tolerant of those sandy conditions. White oak is the other species that tends to be on those dry sites, by the way. So just the oak notes, again, clustered end buds, all oaks, clustered end buds, it should help you get you to at least the family, the oak family. Uh, and then again, red, red oak buds look like a football with one end cut off, they're smooth, stuck on the end of the twig, clustered again, but black oak buds, they're, they tend to be quite large. I think of that as one of the defining features. They may have this velvety hairy coating on them, uh, particularly if the twigs that you're looking at are sprouts from an old stump or they're out in the open and very fast growing, but that's not as reliable as the other trait, which is if you look at the bud square on from the end, instead of looking like a football and being smooth all the way around, it has square or squared off edges. Uh, I think the, the guides will tell you it's angular in the cross section, which I, I, I don't know that that helps to explain that feature. White oak buds are very different. They're small, reddish brown, not hairy at all. And the other things I just talked about, the bark differences between the, the, the two and the sites where we're gonna find them. Zoe, do we have any other questions about the oaks before we move on? Mm. Nope, we'll have to circle back for some birch questions, but let's keep on moving. So we, uh, oh, this is my favorite slide of the three, the three Freds, my fave. Um, so Fred, do you want to cover this? I mean, this is Fred doing an amazing feat here. So this is me with my brothers, Hans and Franz. And uh, Fred on the left is standing next to a black oak. And you can see that blocky appearance that Phil was talking about at the base of the tree. Uh, the middle Fred is standing next to a red oak with those vertical striations. And then the Fred on the, uh, on the right is standing next to a white oak. So you can see the, the basic difference uh, between the three of them. Uh, Sarah asked about acorns. Um, there are differences between the acorns, um, size, the cap that covers the acorns. Um, I don't have my guide to acorns right in front of me, so I don't know if you want to add more, Phil. Yeah, we didn't. Of course, here we are in the winter, and you can see Fred even has snowshoes on. So acorns, uh, we have them in the fall. They're great when we have them, but frankly, I don't use them that much. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, we would have to have done a photo guide for you. Uh, they there are really good. There aren't a lot of textbooks, by the way, that provide you with bark information, but a lot of them do provide you with the twig, the leaf, and you'll find the seeds, the acorns in there. Um, by the way, this photo comes from our Mass Road property in Epping, or, or right next to it. I think we actually stepped over the boundary here just a bit. And those, well, of course I cut and pasted these slides together. Those trees were actually right near each other. We just had to eliminate a little bit of dif distance. Um, so it was a really good spot to look at uh, same sized oaks, all three species together. Um, we find these can be tough for people. The black and the red are the two they confuse. You can see here, white oak is a very different looking bark. To answer a couple of other questions, uh, red oak and black oak lumber do look very similar. Uh, they have that reddish tinge to them. Uh, as far as the acorns, uh, white oak acorns are a preferred food for wildlife. They are sweeter, they have less tannin in them than red oak acorns. Uh, white oak acorns do germinate in the fall. Red oak acorns have to uh, stratify over the winter. And so the red oak group acorns will, uh, will germinate in the spring. So that's one of the differences between, between the acorns. 
someone also asked about swamp white oak. Um, Tuttle Swamp in Lee is a great place to go see swamp white oak. Um, they do grow in wetlands, on the edges of wetlands. Um, they're not widely distributed uh, around, but you, you will find them uh, in some of the low-lying areas uh, in Rockingham County. Yeah, good points, Fred. We also have chestnut oak, which is very scarce in the state, and I think Rockingham County probably has more of that than, than mm -hmm. any other part of the state. And that's found on the opposite kind of sites, found on these very ledgy, dry, yeah. high sites, rocky, uh, ledgy outcrops. Um, uh, <clears throat> the tannin content, by the way, of red oak, I mean, the acorns may be less preferred but uh, you will find, uh, particularly this season, uh, if, you're, if you're a hunter, you know that once the red oak acorns have gone through some weathering and, and had rain and snow and, and quite a washing, the tannin starts to wash out of them. And right now, uh, deer and turkey and everything are pawing up the acorns that have gone through that weathering because the tannin has gotten out of them. And so they're finding them quite palatable now. And uh, okay. fur further south, you also find scarlet oak. And one of the distinguishing features of scarlet oak is that the bark is very similar to black oak, but you will find dead persistent branches. Um, whereas the black and red oaks are good at shedding their old branches, the scarlet oak, those branches will persist for quite a long time. And on larger mature trees, and th don't take this as science, but I find a, found a lot of them were infested with carpenter ants. And whether it's that's due to their age or what, I'm not sure. But now we're gonna go into uh, the maples. And as we mentioned early on, maple is one of the genuses that has opposite branching. If you look at the uh, picture in the middle, you will see a red terminal bud and then further down, you will see two lateral buds opposite of each other. Red maple, the current year twigs will be red. Uh, with red maple, you may find a sharp pointed terminal bud like that. But in a lot of cases, you're also gonna find clusters of round red buds on red, red maple. But that red twig is, is, is the dead giveaway. You'll notice that the bark on the younger trees are gray. Uh, and even on the older trees, if you look up into the canopy, you'll see the light gray texture and, and color of the upper branches. And so when you're looking at a tree and you're looking up at the branching, opposite branching, if, the, if you're able to get a, 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 a sprout growth on the lower bowl, um, you'll see the red twig um, and then the, the gray, the gray bark on the red maple. Next. Red maple is one of those species that grows just about everywhere. You'll find it mid slope, you'll find it upper slope, you'll find it in swamps. Uh, it is one of the most common trees in New Hampshire. Uh, here we have a, a picture of a red maple swamp where there's really not anything else in there but red maple. Uh, you can see a couple of pines in the background, maybe a hemlock growing on a, uh, a hummock. Uh, it doesn't take very much elevation to get uh, a species going, but the red maples do thrive um, in a swamp situation. Next. Here you see it growing along the edge of a fen. Uh, you'll also see it growing. Um, a lot of these species, uh, if they are cut at a young age, the hardwood species I'm talking about, not softwoods, but the hardwoods will re-sprout from the stump. And so you'll get, if you go into the woods and you see these clumps of trees, it may have been, they're not from seed. Um, they will have been from a tree that was cut and then you have sprouts coming up along um, the crown of the stump, um, and that's where you get these, these sprout growth, these multiple sprouts. 
Uh, and red maple is one of those species that you'll find this um, quite a bit. So now we're, we're gonna compare that to its cousin sugar maple uh, or hard maple or rock maple, all the same species. Um, and, and as Fred said, red maple actually is the most common tree in New Hampshire. It's one of the most common trees in New England for that matter. I think just about every state it's, it's rated that because it's found on so many sites and also because of our cultural practices it's not a terribly valuable tree. We've left it behind after a lot of logging. So it's had plenty of chances to reproduce. And also it doesn't seem to be affected by any of these introduced diseases that are coming along. So we tend to have more and more and more red maple as the years go on. But here's sugar maple. Um, and, and this is the one that is used of course for, for making maple syrup. Um, and I like to tell folks that one of the ways that you can identify and differentiate the two is that the bark of sugar maple, particularly when it's younger, is sugar coated. It has that real silvery uh, light color compared to the flat gray that red maple has. Sugar maple has that much more sugary looking coating to it. The buds, and this is actually not a very good picture of the buds, um, at least the picture in the center, the buds are tan and the buds are very sharp pointed and very hard. If you put your thumb or index finger on a red maple bud, it tends to be soft and it, it'll, it'll give under your finger. If you do that with a sugar maple bud uh, during this season when, when everything's hardened off, uh, it can really prick the end of your finger. So that's one of the big differences between them. Again, a, a tan twig and a very red twig in the winter on red maple. <clears throat> uh, so just the comparison notes, and then we're gonna show you some pictures here. Here's another shot of the twigs. And uh, Fred and I got this example on the right here. It, it, it's kind of a poor photo, but you can see the red maple twig is on the right in that shot. And those, this one has those rounded buds on it. And you can see the very sharp pointed sugar maple on the left side. You also have the, the opposite branching showing up very well. So remember that's for this, these two groups we're gonna show you here, maples then ashes. We're talking about opposite branching. Um, uh, the red maple twigs, by the way, they're gonna be green during the growing season. That green is chloroplasts that, uh, that uh, wash out once the photosynthesis period goes by. And so the red, uh, which is another chemical that is found in some of our Northeastern trees, that begins to show up. The reds and purples are under the green and it's just what our eyes catch when that green leaves. Um, I find that people have a lot of trouble with red maple bark. So we're gonna, again, go over some comparison photos in a minute, but it's always flat gray. It does change quite a bit as the tree ages or it, or it can have different appearances. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so um, the other part of this that we should always try to remember is when we're comparing and trying to figure out whether it's a red maple or sugar maple, think about the site. If you're in one of those swamps, real flat land that's wet, I won't guarantee that it can't be sugar maple, but it's almost 100% guarantee that it is not. Sugar maple likes that richer site, usually hillsides, and it's very often mixed with ash and yellow birch and in our part of the state with red oak. So you will not find it, at least you shouldn't find it in these very wet, lowland swampy areas. Red maple will be mixed with it as well because red maple grows everywhere. Uh, so let's just look at some photos. Fred, do you want to cover this one? Uh, okay, um, it, looks, it looks pretty self-explanatory, but this is a typical mixed hardwood stand that you would find on a lot of woodlots um, in Rockingham County uh, Hillsboro and maybe even to Cheshire County. But right there in the middle, we have an older sugar maple 
uh, the bark has roughened up. Um, you can see uh, the old branch wounds right in the center there and to the upper right. Um, sugar maple is one of our shade tolerant species. So the, the lower branches will persist for a longer period of time on sugar maple than they will on uh, red maple or red oak. Um, you can also see uh, leaning to an angle uh, on the left of the sugar maple is, is a very common looking red oak. You've got those vertical striations, uh, fluting we call it sometimes. Uh, if you look at the sugar maples to the, the smaller ones, the, the pole size trees, um, you'll see that they have a very different appearance to that larger sugar maple in the center. Um, it's got that, they've got that sugar coating that, that Phil was talking about, uh, as opposed to the larger tree that has the rougher bark. Uh, in the background there, you can see a white ash, which we will talk about in a minute after we're done with the maples. Again, another opposite branch species. And then far in the background, you've got a smaller red maple. Um, and you've probably got different age classes here as well. You've got that older sugar maple. I don't want to venture an age, but the younger sugar maples have seeded in underneath it. Uh, the red oak might be a compatriot of the sugar maple, but it definitely got started um, before that sugar maple was able to shade out uh, a larger area because a red oak would not be able to seed in under the shade of a mature sugar maple. Anything else, Bill? No, that covers it very well. Thanks, Fred. And so here's another comparison. And here we have red maples right next to some sugar maples. And uh, left slide, uh, uh, you know, again, you have a flat gray. This doesn't show that we didn't have very good light on the trunk here, but this doesn't show that sugar coating that well on those two smaller sugar maples behind it. Slide on the on the right, uh, sugar maple starting to plate a little bit. Um, as sugar maple ages, it develops plates that peel up at about a 45 degree angle on the bottom of it. And right behind that, you have red maple. Fred had said earlier when the red maple was introduced that if you look up, even on mature red maples, the upper bark is smooth gray, somewhat like beech should look. We'll see beech in a little bit, um, like a healthy beech should look, and that the upper part of red maple bark. But again, a flat gray, it doesn't have that sugar coating. So I just wanted to interject here. Um, we are at 2.22, and I know we had a hard stop time of 2.30, but I think we can probably get through the rest of the maples and maybe hit the ash tree, but I think we're gonna have to wrap it up probably after that. That's good. That works for you guys, okay. Folks will right have access to this slide program, Zoe, and uh, they, can, they can run through this. There are a lot more species. We kind of thought that we wouldn't get through this and it's, it's Fred, he's just so wordy, you know? <laughs> Blame it all on Fred. <laughs> So I'm going to jump by this one, Fred, and we'll we'll dive into the ash trees. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I guess that we'll dive into the one other maple that we've got. We can cover this really quickly. This is striped maple, and this is an example. We threw this in because this is this is a, an example of an understory tree. If you think about our forests having layers. Uh, there are some trees that develop and they never really get into the upper canopy at all. They've evolved to be able to tolerate a tremendous amount of shade. Uh, and striped maple is one of those uh, quite beautiful small trees that, that's perfectly happy being down low in the understory. Never gets that big. Um, and it has this unusual and really neat green bark with white stripes uh, that are vertical on it. Um, they don't show very well on this slide. Um, the other part of it is if you look at the buds, this is an example of what are called stocked buds. Again, opposite branching and the terminal buds here, the photo shows you that the buds are perched on a little pedestal. It's called a stocked buds, a stocked bud, uh, which is 
uh, not very common. So if you see that trait uh, in trees or shrubs, it helps narrow the list very quickly. Okay, Fred, now we're on to ash trees. Okay, thank you, Phil. Uh, white ash uh, is one of three ash species that we have in New Hampshire, the others being black and green. And we'll try to get to all of those before our, our deadline. But white ash is actually a sad story um, because of an insect called the emerald ash borer. But we'll get into that in a minute. But if you look at the middle picture there, um, you'll notice a very distinct leaf scar underneath the lateral bud. And if you look at those little dots in the leaf scar, those are called bundle scars. And that's actually the vascular system of the leaf that dropped off of the tree in the fall. Oh, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, the terminal bud uh, it has two scales. Um, and you can see that it forms like a, a pyramid on top of the tree. The, uh, again, opposite branching, the bark is furrowed, uh, as you can see on the mature tree on the left. For those of you who may have Norway maples on your property, um, which we're not going to cover today, but to me, the bark of a mature ash tree looks very similar to the bark of a mature Norway maple with those vertical uh, striations in the bark. White ash is a very light wood. Um, it's also uh, light in color, I should say. Um, it also has a very low moisture content for, for a tree that grows in an area of deep, rich soil with good water uh, retention. Um, this, the tree itself has very low. I always like to say if you, if you cut firewood, you can, you can cut down an ash, split it, and throw it in your wood stove the same day. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see again the very clear opposite branching uh, of the white ash. Next. So again, I mentioned we have three ash species. Uh, white ash is our timber species. Um, unfortunately, with the, the uh, emerald ash borer, we are losing ash at a rapid pace. Black ash is a species that is, as Phil has said here, restricted to wetlands. You will grow, you'll see it growing in black ash swamps. This is the species that Native uh, Americans use to make baskets. Um, they will actually take a bolt of black ash, they will pound on it with a mallet, and it will separate at the growth rings, and they will use those strips uh, to make baskets. Green ash um, is again, is, is a more of a southern species, primarily found around along river corridors, but it is widely planted. Um, green ash grows in anaerobic conditions, um, low soil oxygen levels. And so green ash has been widely planted um, as a street tree and as a parking lot tree. If you've ever been to the Grapponi Center in Concord, most of the trees along the, uh, the edge of, of the Grapponi Center are green ash. Uh, the trees outside of the Rockingham County complex are green ash. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I did a uh, Grow It Green um, the grew it green with uh, WMUR a few years ago to talk about the problems with emerald ash borer, but it is a. Um, do you have a Do you have a, a picture of? Oh, there we go. So when we look, um, we'll get into a little bit of, of insect identification now. Um, if you have seen any ash trees um, in Rockingham County or Merrimack County. If you look at the tree on the right, you can see a close-up view of what the woodpeckers have done, pecking away at the outer bark, causing this quote-unquote blonding. Uh, the tree on the left, you can see the blonding all up and down the, uh, the bark of the tree. Uh, this is where the woodpeckers have been pecking off the outer bark in search of the larvae. And um, it only takes um, one or two years, three at the most, 
uh, for for trees to die. So um, it's a, the, the exit holes of the insect. You can see how small uh, compared to like an Asian longhorn beetle, how small the emerald ash borer are, but they're this iridescent green color. Um, and it's very prolific. They make an S-shaped gallery underneath the bark, which is a dead giveaway for emerald ash borer. And when the adults emerge in the spring, they'll emerge from say, oh, May to October. So they have a long period where they, they emerge from the trees. Uh, some will overwinter as eggs and some will overwinter as larvae, depending on when, when the eggs were laid. So that's that with emerald ash borer. Yeah, and just a, a note, these are actually pictures from my own property and Fred and I did an inventory there uh, a year ago uh, and we looked and looked. We didn't find any evidence that we could clearly say that any of my ash, the ash trees on our property uh, were affected by this insect. And just over this past summer, it's exploded. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds of trees now on my property that are now in this condition. So this is an explosive problem and uh, it doesn't look good for mature ash trees in New Hampshire in the near term, that's for sure. It's really unfortunate. Zoe, I think we're out of trees or out of time, I should say, not out of trees. Plenty of trees left. All right, so um, I think that what, so we did have one question that I just wanted to circle back to from the beginning before we go, um, which was how much change are you seeing in the microclimactic influences due to climate change? How's climate change affecting this? Um, yeah, that's a really hard thing to, you know, even though Fred and I are getting a little long in the tooth, uh, but I will say this, I make maple syrup, and um, one of the things I always think about is um, that we are now tapping a month earlier than we used to tap 40 years ago. And we're seeing there are some very sensitive things like when the sap runs that seems to have shifted that way because there's been some kind of a subtle change in when all that happens. You know, Sap runs take, say, a 20 degree night and a 40 degree day for it to be perfect in a high pressure system. Um, uh, the, most of the maple producers do say that th this is something they look at as being one of the changes. I don't know what, you know, our winters are, we just don't get the freeze ups that we used to get for logging. So I look at that as an issue, though the southern part of the state was always a little problematic. It's much more problematic now. So we don't really get the frozen ground. Um, but it, over time, we've been told that we're gonna see species shifts that are gonna, you know, some are gonna move north and some of the southern species like the oaks are gonna be doing better. Um, but we're not gonna see, you know, that's, that's gonna be lifetimes for those kinds of changes to take place. I hope, I, I think. Great. Um, well, we have, um, I think that the best way to do it, I have a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to, but we can, I will send out a follow-up email to everyone who uh, registered and was here and we'll have the recording, you'll have a PDF of the, or a copy of the slide so you can go back through. Um, and another thing people have been asking for in the comments has been, um, some field guide suggestions. So hopefully, so I think we can put our heads together and get a, a nice list of great tree books for to share with the group. Um, and I can send that out uh, as soon as I can download the recording and everything. Um, so I guess without further ado, we will say thank you so much to Phil and Fred. Um, getting a lot of thank yous in the comments too. I think people really enjoyed that. Um, I will be sending that email out, and if you think of more questions after we log off, feel free to email me, and I can put everyone in touch, and we'll, we'll be sure to, to get the questions, get your questions answered. Somebody asked if we would do a part two to finish this, and I would be amenable to that, Zoe. Um, 
you know, I don't want to speak for Phil, but, you know, we've got the rest of the presentation. And if you wanted to schedule another follow-up, um, I'm willing to help. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot. We didn't really even get, I don't think we got halfway through this. Um, let me just say, you know, the, the guides are, are great. Um, and, and we'll do that for folks. Um, and again, you do have this slide presentation and we're willing to run through this again uh, from here forward. So we'll start with Beach. Uh, but really one of the things I always recommend to folks is go to a piece of property that you frequent and maybe take what you've learned here and some of what you've gotten in the guides. But the way you really learn this is sort of the way you learn music or a lot of other things. It's by repeat, repeat, repeat. And just look at, look at a species you're comfortable with seeing that you know is correct and look at its bark and then start comparing it as you move through the forest. That's really the way it clicks. And then before you know it, it's gonna be like a Beatles song, just a few words and you'll have it. You know, you'll know what it is. Oh. <laughs> Great, yeah, we'll look into it. Well, I'll talk with Phil and Fred and we'll, we'll figure something out for part two. It feels wrong to leave it so open-ended. Um, so thank you. I guess we'll, we'll end it here. So thank you everybody so much. And um, we hope to hear from you soon and I will follow up with that email. All right, you thank you Zoe for hosting. Uh, Thanks all. Feel free to email. We'll see y'all soon. Bye. Bye.